Hello and welcome to The Menu, Monaco Radio's food and drink program. I'm your host, Chiara Rimella. Today, we sit down with renowned chef Massimo Bottura and his wife, Lara Gilmore, to learn about their new book, Slow Food and Fast Cars. It's about the long, slowly aging process that uh, makes uh, this place uh, and these products unique. Also in the programme, Lucrezia Motta finds out about the new festive menu at one of her favourite French restaurants in London. But at the same time, when you go eat at a restaurant, it is a celebration usually. It's, it should be like a special occasion, a feast. So I kind of just want to really go for it on this one. All that here in the menu on Monocle Radio. Slow food and fast cars may not seem like a natural combination, but this is the name of a new food and lifestyle book co-written by the renowned Italian chef Massimo Bottura and his wife Lara Gilmore. It makes sense, though, when you think about where the pair are based, the picturesque region of Emilia-Romagna, birthplace of prosciutto di Parma, Ferrari and Maserati. It's here that in 2019 they opened their idyllic guesthouse Casa Maria Luigia inside an 18th century palazzo. Nestled in the countryside and just a short drive from Bottura's famed restaurant Osteria Francescana in Modena, Casa Maria Luigia is a getaway for both food and motorsport enthusiasts. Here, visitors can enjoy the guest house's unusual menu, admire the art on display, as well as Bottura's own collection of cars and motorbikes. Home to Al Gatto Verde, a restaurant that experiments with cooking with flames, Casa Maria Luigia is a place of contradiction and innovation, which also champions family values and local ingredients. Massimo and Lara join Monocle's Isabella Jewell in our London studio to share the story of their latest release. It's not a simple recipe book. It's definitely a cookbook because it has so many recipes from Casimir Luigia. But Casimir Luigia, as it is a small inn, bed and breakfast, whatever you want to call it, with our 12 rooms, is a place where we serve breakfast, snacks in the house, both savory and sweet. And we also do a what we call tola dolce, Sunday brunch, which is a pretty gourmet, smoky, wonderful meal. So the recipe book contains all of those moments of the day, but it also has a lot of stories that tell how we got here, what we're doing, how we embarked upon this new project, and some of the adventures that happened along the way. If we could turn our thoughts now to the food that is put on a pedestal in this book. Massimo, would you mind just first telling me what slow food means to you? It's an expression for me. I reflect about uh, the slowly aging process in Emilia-Romagna. Emilia is the art of the food valley. We have more EGP and DOP protected uh, product than any other state in Europe. It's about the long slowly aging process that uh, makes uh, this place uh, and these products unique. If you think that we can wait uh, four years to taste a Parmigiano Reggiano or like uh, 36 months for a prosciutto or a culatello or 25 years to taste a balsamic vinegar, it's crazy if you think about that in uh, modern time. But for us, it's like this, and tradition are still there. We have uh, to respect this kind of slowly aging process. On the other side, uh, we have to break tradition to build new tradition. So this is a kind of the craziness that is uh, in our life, you know. Picking up on that craziness and this idea of breaking tradition, can you point me to any recipes where you've really kind of flipped Italian traditional cooking or at least regional cooking on its head? This book is not about my cooking. It's about Jessica cooking. That is uh, our chef. What I do is like I give, I share a vision and that uh, she can interpret what is going to be. For example, like breakfast to me, is the best breakfast in the world. I really say because I really believe in that. It's so personal and so unique because the tradition of Christmas breakfast when my grandmother was cooking for the whole family. My grandmother, she wasn't a great cook. 
because she had to cook. My mom, she was a great cook because she loved to cook. But Christmas Day, my grandmother was cooking breakfast in such a lovely way that to me it was like, first thing, just take care of that. Rebuild in a wood burn oven the breakfast that my grandmother was cooking. And people go crazy. They spend hours sitting at the, at the table, picking one things, moving from a sbrizolona to a cotechino under the ashes with some zabayone, breaking the border between sweet and savory and fried dough and mortadella and uh, herbazzone. You know, the healthy food is always left. <laughs> the main Christmas breakfast, because... In Maria Luisa, it's Christmas every day. A lot of people wouldn't think of breakfast as an important meal for Italy, right? Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, it's often true. it's seen as maybe yeah. a cappuccino and a little biscuit, a, a bush yeah. or maybe yeah. a cornetto a pistacchio. One minute, one minute. Exactly. And that's it. Yeah, it's stand done. at the bar, drink the coffee and leave. So is this something that you're trying to kind of make a big thing? Italian yeah. breakfast is like the next brunch. Absolutely. And, you know, we're in the countryside and the breakfast in the countryside, you know, farmers would come back, they'd leave for the fields at five in the morning and come back at around 11 and have la prima colazione. So breakfast was a celebration and there was sausage and there was eggs and there was gnocco fritto, this fried dough, and you'd have your mortadella and salumi and the ricotta that is made from the milk of the uh, the parmigiano reggiano cows. So that is kind of the identity of this breakfast, the idea that you have to start your day with deliciousness and rich flavors. And because we have this wood-fired oven on the property, we began experimenting with that before we even opened the hotel. And Jessica just thought everything tasted better when it had its, when the eggs, the frittata, it goes into a cast iron skillet and gets cooked in that wood-burning oven, or the cotechino, as Massimo was saying, which we actually serve with. Zabayone. I forget about the frittata. <laughs> the cotechino with zabayone. Y- you should see when Italians arrive, they look at it and they say, cotechino for breakfast. <laughs> and we say, yes, cotechino for breakfast. Try it. You'll never be the same. And the f- amazing thing is that even the Italians who are used to cornetto, cappuccino, you know, that's a really post-war economic boom breakfast that happened when Italy started changing, when Italy started growing after the war and there was this movement and nobody had time anymore to sit down and have breakfast. So we tell the Milanese when they come, slow down, try the cotechino, and you just might come back for it. The idea of a savory breakfast feels very much more Northern European, doesn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, Jessica and I are both North Americans. Jessica's from Montreal. I'm from New York. Both t- decided to move to Italy fell in love with the country, fell in love with Modena, and started to see that there were some elements of this terroir, the food, the landscape, the artisan ingredients that maybe weren't celebrated enough by the Modenese themselves. And so sometimes it's that distance, taking two steps back and seeing something from another point of view, that we really push to have these flavors first and foremost. From distance, they saw things in a different way. And... They opened that door, the door of the unexpected for all the locals. And the locals ask to come and have breakfast there. So it's incredible to see even locals that eat and most Italians, how much they love that kind of breakfast. And cappuccino is an intercalare. <laughs> so between uh, one frittata and erbazzone, a cappuccino. Let's have another one. You know, because it's like, wow. That's when you know you're onto a winner when you win <laughs> over Italians with, you know, with your cooking. Can I talk to you both a little bit about these gorgeous essays that you've written in between the recipes where you're telling different stories and pulling on different moments, reflecting on, for example, your rather hilarious proposal. I love that essay. Can you tell me oh, a little bit Oh, will you marry more? me? Will you marry me? <laughs> oh, we're so amazing. Um, I mean, part of the essays were written to also show how much time we spend at Casa Luigia and how much it is a passion project. I feel very lucky to have the opportunity to meet guests who come from all over the world. You know, in your restaurant experience, the three or four hour dining experience that you have 
is very limited in the amount that you can share and get to know somebody at the table. Whereas when you see them at breakfast, maybe not at their best or completely shiny or hungover from the night before or walking on the path or running in the garden or in the kitchen, there's a different kind of exchange that happens. And I think there's a real humanity. What I've discovered in this aspect of hospitality is just how amazing it is to share and hear people's stories. So when this young couple told me their wonderful romantic story, he's Italian and she is from Boston and how they met and fell in love. And that love story, the thread was this red Ferrari that constantly he was dreaming about. And so when they saw us in the uh, Testarossa, uh, the whole story came out. It's amazing to be witness to those kinds of events, people getting engaged or celebrations, so many newlyweds who come through and just to see people at the beginning of their lives on a journey and looking to Massimo and I with a kind of desire to follow what we've done, work together, dream together, get through the hard times together. If we can be an inspiration to them, that feels worthy. Because the atmosphere in the hotel, and I think this deeply, it's like home away from home. So it's not an hotel. It's not a bed and breakfast. It's not. Uh, it's just our home that we decide to name under my mom, because my mom she always had this kind of approach with door open, come in, we take care of you. My friends, girlfriend, aunt, you know, everyone. And um, since I was a kid, so we learn that the power of hospitality. Even from uh, all the, the project that we have uh, with the refectorio, with feeding the people, the Earth Court uh, here in London is amazing. It's a beautiful place. And uh, we learn uh, that the power of hospitality and the word welcome, come in, enjoy, it's really powerful. The kitchen is always open. There's always a little chunk of Parmigiano and Lambrusco. You understand you are in Modena immediately. Or the refrigerator is always full with beautiful snacks that you can snack. No one is asking you to sign anything. You want a cappuccino? You feel for an espresso? Just go make your own espresso or your own cappuccino. This is what we mean for home away from home. And there are a lot of candid moments that happen. I'm just thinking of one that this story isn't in the book because it happened just recently. But I was going out and um, cutting some flowers in, in the park, and the grass was so wet and dewy, I kind of threw my shoes off because I didn't want to get them wet, my, my loafers. And uh, so I just went through barefoot and picked some of these hydrangeas and putting them in a bowl. And this lovely Swedish woman saw me doing that, and she said, you really need a good pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and the next week, I got in the mail a box of shoes, sneakers, hokas, and a beautiful note. And on the outside of the letter, it said, life is not a fairy tale. If you lost your shoes at midnight, you were drunk. And I just thought, you know, this person went, asked what my shoe size was, bought the shoes, gave it to me as, as a thank you for letting her in, letting everyone into also the behind the scenes. It's a small property. There's no place to hide. There's no place to, we're always ourselves and they see working in the garden or moving bushes or uh, the back scenes of, of a restaurant, of a life, of a hotel, uh, whatever you want to call it. And I think people appreciate that. It feels magical in a way and it doesn't feel too constructed or too perfect. There's an element of imperfection at Casa Merluigia that is just enough room for you to jump in and see the humanity behind it. This happens all the time. Two weeks ago, I received a brand new Ferrari. Yeah, a guy from... <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd struggle to pack that in a box with a neat note, wouldn't you? <laughs> now, that's a lovely segue because we've talked about food and slow food. So now let's turn our attention to fast cars. <laughs> Massimo, can you tell me about your love for these four-wheeled machines? I grew up in a very large family, as I said. Also, pretty wealthy family. And my father was really into cars. And my brothers, the older brothers too. So I was the younger one. And uh, usually, <laughs> you know, growing up, I was like trying to sneak into one of the cars, steal the car and uh, drive, you know, beautiful 
sporker. And when you grow up like that and you have uh, all around Ferrari, Maserati, Lamborghini, Pagani, De Tommaso, Ducati, the circuit uh, in uh, downtown Modena, wow, it's, it's in your DNA. You can feel the sound in distance and, and say, oh, that's an eight cylinder from the sound from the sound is a Maserati or is a Ferrari. You know, it's, it's like this, you know, we grew up like that. So it's here in our, you know, here in our, my vein, there's balsamic vinegar, the muscle of Parmigiano, but in the DNA, there's the engine that is going and moving so fast as a 12 cylinder Ferrari. I think uh, w what we have done in Casa Maria Luisa was an intuition as a, a perfect place because it's uh, very, very close uh, to Modena, south, the highway, 20 minutes to Maranello or the airport. On the other side of the property, like two kilometers away, like there's a Pagani. It's all there. And I thought it was like really natural in a place like that to put together all the excellence of Modena. Because people don't realize everything happened in Modena, in a small town with 200,000 people. And this is something that our guest loves so much because they can see the engineer and experience the engineer of unique cars, like imagine Lamborghini. When we got the title of best wrestler in the world, the CEO, Domenicali, one day he told me, okay, where are you? Uh, I'm in Maria Luigia, Stefano. Why? Because I'm coming with the present. And he arrived and he was driving this beautiful convertible Lamborghini, all white on the front part. Oops. <laughs> and the crash, yellow lemon tart smash on top of the Lamborghini, all painted by the artists, these guys they are making this car are almost artists. And in the back, you have Lamborghini upside down with the rights. Oops. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is incredible. So imagine, Maria Luis is a place for magic. Something magic is happening every day. You just have to be open to persuasion. East or West, what's the best? <laughs> and, and, and that comes together in this space called the playground, which is on the far end of the property, and it's this barn from the 1960s that our neighbors sold us after we had already opened up um, Casamar Luigia. And in that, we emptied out this barn, and we started dreaming of a space that could be like a rec center. We call it the playground for adults, and the ultimate space for adults. It has a flipper machine. It has foosball. It has a pool table from the turn of the century. <laughs> and then it has all these amazing Ducati motorcycles that Massimo's collected over time, and some of them he's made with the Ducati company, and they have particular personal stories, and he's added his own details and made the, each one of them personal. There's this sense of bringing all the spaces together and all the things that we love, and then you turn around and there's a yeah. Testarossa. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's a really wonderful place of quite a lot of contradictions. You know, you've yeah. got your yeah. slow, heavy breakfast and then a really fast lap around in a Ferrari. Do you have car people or food people or people who love both coming? <laughs> both, 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 both. Everything is like, you, you walk there, you love art. You really have a good selection of the contemporary art. Past 40 years. You love uh, nature. It's a park that is like 250 years old that Lara rebuilt in such a good way, you know, with little details, one by one, the eels of the lovers, where people get lost reading. The garden with all the fresh herbs, seasonal vegetables. You have the path where you walk into all these uh, fruit trees. And this is uh, the, the nature part. Then you have the cars. That is the technical, industrial excellence of Modena. But also have the food. Even the food. Imagine. You know, uh, 
is all about the people always but design she was very low key low profile before but you know you can see in uh, every room uh, the best of the best of italy you know the music room you have the proust uh, 1981 by mendini or in one room uh, you have joe ponti mirrors mixed with the wallpaper of gucci it's all a mixture of uh, who we love because at this point of our life we have the privilege to pick to work with the people we love this is an incredible privilege maria luigia is the expression of all this love now it's time for the week's top food and drink headlines here is monocle's monica lillis white and rosé wine now account for more than half of global wine consumption according to the international organization of wine and vine According to a recent report, the boom in demand is due to the rising popularity of sparkling wine and the change in composition of drinkers. The demand for red wine by comparison is drastically falling, declining by 15% from its peak in 2007. An official menu for a state banquet that bears the signature of former Chinese leader Mao Zedong has been sold at auction for 275,000 US dollars. Our auction, based in Boston, said the menu was from a banquet held in Beijing in 1956 that commemorated Pakistan's first state visit to China. The menu featured food from both nations, including roast Peking duck and shark's fin in brown sauce. And finally, fast food chain McDonald's has unveiled plans for a new retro-style restaurant called Cosmics, focusing on hot and cold speciality drinks. Its pilot will open near Chicago later this month and aims to be in 10 locations by the end of 2024. The concept is the brand's latest effort to crack the coffee market, especially in the US where nearly two-thirds of the country drinks at least one cup a day. Those are the week's food and drink headlines. Now back to Chiara. Thanks, Monica. You're listening to The Menu. The French are known for their culinary prowess, and Christmas is no exception. From seafood platters and top-notch wines to creamy desserts, traditional festive meals are filled with rich flavours that guarantee cheer for the whole table. French restaurants around the world are flag-bearers of these culinary hallmarks for the holidays. In London, French-inspired spot Eline is taking these beloved traditions and adding a British twist for its seasonal menu. Monaco's Lucrezia Motta headed to the restaurant to find out more about its festive a la carte offering. Just a few steps away from the Hoxton tube station in East London, you can find Eline on the ground floor of the Rosewood building. This elegant restaurant and wine shop has recently unveiled their winter menu, with rich and indulgent dishes just in time from the holidays. Founders Alex Reynolds and Maria Viviani tell me more. Mm, well, I mean, we moved to Italy during the pandemic, and like when we were there, it's, it's quite hard to get a job if you don't speak Italian. And so we thought it'd be lovely if we opened uh, our own little spot there with like a weekly changing menu. And uh, we got really, really excited about it. And then unfortunately, uh, me staying in Italy ended up being a bit difficult, what with Brexit and everything. And uh, when we came here, we decided to see if we could kind of keep that dream going. And yeah, it took a farewell to find the right space, yes. and then it was a long process. <laughs> but it was amazing because like it was just a literally a concrete box, and so we got to have it like designed exactly the way we want. Like, Eline opened in 2022, and its intimate setting with sleek design and cozy atmosphere is everything you'd want to find in your favorite neighborhood shop. The restaurant itself resembles Alex and Maria's favorite ways to eat. We, we like to go out to places where we always have our comfort food, but we also like going to places where we're able to taste different things all the time. And we ourselves are very seasonal eaters. Like, it gets to this point in, the, uh, in time of the year, and we want butter. richer food. Yeah, butter. <laughs> richer food and something more warm and, yeah, just autumn or winter produce. And yeah. I feel like that really reflects in our menu. Named after Alex's grandmother... Eline is deeply infused with his French heritage. The classic French thing is, well, my grandmother uh, lived in Paris and took me out, like, a lot. And then a lot of my training in kitchens is based around classic French techniques. It's why there's, 
like a hollandaise sauce, there's a bordelaise, all of the, all the sauces, all the backbone, the braises, the stews, it's all based on classic French cooking. We just, we're in England, so we we'll use English ingredients or put a little bit of a twist on it. But it's important that you have like, that flavor base, because I mean, yeah. French cooking is pretty awesome. The current menu is filled with seasonal wintry flavors, from the pork terrine to the pumpkin with pickled ginger and roasted cabbage. So it was really about kind of more viewing it, maybe the way that a customer would, and like, obviously having a changing menu all the time is great, but at the same time, when you go eat at a restaurant, it is a celebration usually. It's, it should be like a special occasion, a feast, so I kind of just wanted to really go for it on this one. French and British festive traditions are in constant dialogue to create a fun experience for guests. And scallops are, you know, they're a sacrifice for the restaurant to put on. They, they cost so much money. But it just makes you really happy, you know, especially when it's like one big, beautiful scallop on the plate. Uh, it's the same thing with like doing the Wellington. So much work in the kitchen, like you have to get the meat prep it, make a mousse, wrap that around it, make a pancake, wrap that, make a dough, wrap that, put a lattice, bake it, hope the meat's perfectly cooked. But, you know, especially the way we send it out whole, not as a carved slice. You see tables of four and stuff, they have so much fun, like, just trying to cut it themselves. And so a lot of it was based around that. Creating a seasonal menu has its challenges, but Maria Viviani explains this allows the Yelin team to push the limits of creativity. This year uh, it was a weird one because of um, the weather being a bit strange, the seasons being a bit late, autumn kind of not existing. So we also have those things to think about. You can't just set. You have an idea of which products will be available and nice at what time of the year, but you also have to wait to see if that actually happens and when it happens. If you go through Alice's phone, you will find thousands of different dishes and ideas and lots of different flavor combinations that he wants to try. And you can't force nature to do the things that you want it to do. So if the weather's not been what it should have and, I don't know, peas take a little longer to come yeah. out or stone fruit is not quite ready, why would you rush it? Why would you serve it if it's not great? Seasonal menus are part of Alex and Maria's sustainable approach to hospitality which includes wasting as little as possible of the ingredients at hand. I mean, that's for me, that's kind of just a classical uh, French thing. You, know, you, you get the meat in, you have the prime piece that you're going to use maybe for a roast or for a raw application. Then the bits around that, then maybe it's better to do a braised bit or turn into a croquette. And then all the bones and things are what you want to make the sauce out of. It's not just from an environmentally conscious kind of approach. We're also a restaurant that's also a business, and that's where you have to be creative and clever. Don't not binning stuff because it's not nice to do that, because we're working with very sensible product, and it's not like a lot of food in the world to go and and throw things away, Uh, especially because the the industry is very responsible for this kind of (laughs) this kind of issue. But it's also nice to get creative, find other ways to use different things. Eline also houses a wine shop, which is fully stocked with bottles of natural wine coming from all over Europe. And in terms of the wine shop, I feel like it's, uh, it's a good opportunity for people to take home a bit of their meal. Um, most of our wine sales are after people have dined, tried a bottle and said, this is so delicious and we just want to take one more like one more bottle home and I think that's lovely because sometimes there's a little momentum of your meal and even if it was a special occasion you can even keep the bottle like I don't know for like a couple months or something and then celebrate and open it again oh do you remember when we were to eat here and this was so tasty I am a sucker for French wines even being Argentinian and like my family being um, my ancestry being Italian I have developed a love for them especially a Burgundy or a Jura, which is uh, which are the two regions which I find like most wines that I love and, and I can't stop drinking. I would say a full-bodied white from either of those regions or a lighter red. And I yeah. feel like it, it's a region where winemakers have inherited this land and they try to push with natural winemaking and when they take care, they take care of the vines organically and they try this different approach 
and they're discovering new things. It's a true skill uh, of, for me, for the winemakers that do natural wine and, and produce this kind of quality of, of bottles because uh, they really know what they're doing. With a rich menu and relaxing ambience, Elina's the place to go if you're looking for a good bottle of French wine and an indulgent festive meal in the heart of Shoreditch. From Monocle in London, I'm Lucrezia Motta. And that's all for this edition of The Menu. Remember that we are back with a new episode again on Friday at 2000 London time. That's at midday in San Francisco. Also, don't forget to tune into our spin-off show, Food Neighbourhoods, for a tour of some of the world's tastiest destinations. I am Kira Rimella. This programme was produced by Monica Lillis and our studio engineer was Callum McLean. Once again, we finished this programme with a dinner soundtrack recommendation.